My name is Kwajalein Jackson. I'm the executive director at Feminist Women's Health Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've been working for Feminist Women's Health Center since 2013. I entered as a volunteer coordinator, working with our um, outreach programs and um, our advocacy work. I was then um, promoted to uh, community education and advocacy director. Um, and became the executive director in 2018 um, and was the first um, Black executive director in the organization's history. Um, in my role as executive director, um, it is primarily an administrative position. I'm responsible for our financial management, for our policies and procedures, our hiring practices, our organizational structure and culture. I'm not a clinician, so I'm not um, working actively seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, but I am trying to make strategic decisions to ensure the sustainability and visibility of the organization. So in addition to the work that I do on a daily basis at Feminist Center, going over our financial statements and writing grant proposals, I'm also a part of several uh, local and national coalitions. I serve on other reproductive health rights and justice boards um, and do a lot of other community partnerships in order to make sure that the institution is um, embedded in the movement, is um, connected to the larger reproductive health rights and justice ecosystem in Georgia and across the country. So because abortion is such a um, contentious issue in our country, um, and because people who are anti-abortion go to such extremes to try to make it um, difficult, if not impossible, for people to access care, we do have protesters who show up outside of our clinic and many clinics across the country to intimidate, harass, um, and threaten our patients, our staff, and our clinicians. And for us, one of the things that makes that so unsettling is that because we are a, a Black-led clinic um, and the majority of the staff who see patients are Black people, the majority of patients that we serve are Black people. Oftentimes, the protesters use racialized language to specifically try to um, disturb our patients and staff. So evoking um, language around uh, Black Lives Matter, um, but applying it as a weapon to say that we, we could not believe that Black Lives Matter if we were participating in abortion, um, accusing us of Black genocide, um, uh, making assumptions and accusations about people being, um, about people's relationships, about whether or not they have other children or other parts of their family, just a lot of harm that comes to the people who, again, are both providing the care and the patients who are coming in for that care. We, in response to this, have security on site. Um, we have to hire multiple um, security guards to help make sure that patients can come in um, safely, um, that they can drive in um, with care. We also have volunteers who help to support and create a welcoming environment for our patients. Um, we call them clinic liaisons instead of escorts. Um, and we try really hard not to rely upon law enforcement unless it is absolutely necessary because we know that the presence of police and sometimes even security um, is not always a welcoming environment for folks who are just trying to get care, who are already coming in with a myriad of emotions that they are trying to overcome and work through. So we do our best to just get people in, once we get people inside, um, to just make sure that they feel cared for, that they feel seen, 
um, that they feel comfortable, as comfortable as possible. Um, we're really fortunate that we own our building, we own our property. And so the positioning of our building does not allow the protesters to be immediately in front of the doors. We have sort of a, um, a natural buffer zone because of the way our parking lot surrounds our facility. Um, but that's not true of many, many clinics that are storefronts right on the public right of way. So um, again, so many of us are trying to navigate how to create a welcoming and warm environment while also keeping security and safety at the utmost importance. Um, so, and that's Georgia, not what anybody should have to deal with um, when they're going to get help. There are a laundry list of regulations that are required for us to um, provide for patients in advance of their procedure and during their appointment. Um, one is called the woman's right to know, um, and it essentially is um, biased, mandatory language that we have to provide the patient with at least 24 hours before their appointment time. Again, we are really fortunate that in Georgia, we're able to deliver that information by phone um, at the time that the person is calling for their appointment. But in many clinics, the patient has to come and receive that information in person and then wait. So come, leave 24, 48, sometimes even 72 hours before then they are able to come back to get the abortion that they need. Um, it includes all kinds of medically inaccurate language um, and irrelevant information that would not normally be included in informed consent, but we have to read it to them anyway. And so we try to provide some caveats just to say we're required by law to provide this information to you. Um, you have to affirm that you have received it. If you request it in writing, your 24 hours starts over again. <laughs> um, in addition to the women's right to know um, counseling, we also are required to offer that a patient um, see the image of their ultrasound or and or hear the fetal heart tones. They do not have to do either, but they do have to um, sign a consent form saying whether they agreed to or not. So we have to offer it no matter what. Sometimes that can be confusing to folks. Um, it can certainly be really upsetting. Um, sometimes people are curious and interested and it doesn't necessarily affect the rest of their appointment. It really just depends on the individual. Um, but because lawmakers have decided that this tactic could be useful in potentially dissuading or shaming people, um, it is required by law. What I have found is overwhelmingly, this does not change people's minds about the abortions that they've already decided to have. So in the United States and in many parts of the world, but in the United States, the attacks, the political attacks against abortion access and reproductive health in general have been constant and unrelenting. Um, and so as a clinic and an advocacy organization, we work collaboratively on the local level and on the national level to try to protect and defend the fragile rights that we already have, um, as well as to expand access in whatever ways we can proactively. So at the local level, we are a part of a reproductive health rights and justice coalition that includes um, a Planned Parenthood affiliate that represents the Southeast, abortion funds, um, and reproductive justice organizations that are focused on communities of color, all working together to mobilize our bases, bring people to the Capitol, encourage people to vote, um, and deepen people's understanding about what is included in reproductive justice and how it affects their lives. On the national level, we are members of the Abortion Care Network, which is a um, 
membership organization that serves independent abortion providers across the country. And we're also members of the National Abortion Federation that helps to provide security and clinical protocols um, and standards for the country for people who are providing abortion care. We're a part of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance that works to um, protect maternal health and birth justice um, and works to try to correct for um, the ways that maternal health and maternal mor mortality have continued to um, affect Black people across the country. Um, so, I mean, that's just a, a sampling. I mean, we, we certainly um, know that this work, it requires us to work um, creatively, um, to strategize. Um, and, you know, I think in addition, I would add, like, working across issue, not just on things that affect abortion, but, you know, the things that are affecting the full lives of the folks that we serve. So we are part of the movement for Black Lives. We are working a, in lockstep with LGBTQ organizations, with immigrant and refugee serving organizations, because we understand that we have um, shared opponents very frequently in the policymakers who seek to prevent um, our communities from being able to thrive. Much of the fight for uh, abortion access in the 60s and 70s, what's really commonly seen as the second wave feminism um, was led by and centered the experiences of uh, white women. That's not to say that black women were actively participating in those movements and working alongside, but we're not typically seen as the face or the center of the pro-choice movement in that time. And in part, I think that for many white women in that moment, the ability to exercise more autonomy over their reproduction, having access to birth control and abortion care felt like an opportunity to enter the workplace, to have more independence, to have um, sort of a crack in the glass ceiling. But the reality for many Black women and women of color was that they were already working, that parenthood, pregnancy, um, had never been a barrier to work <laughs> because uh, for generations, we were being asked to work and parent simultaneously to, in some cases, um, put our parenting on the back burner so that we could provide labor um, that was necessary to build this country. And so I think that that's one of the really key pieces, the really key differences in like the motivation that I see looking historically over um, the ways that Black people and, um, and white women were sort of thinking about reproductive freedom really differently. So it's just sort of a little bit of my context for it. I think that that is somewhat different today. Um, I know that, again, uh, there's a much broader understanding about reproductive justice as distinct from a choice binary that um, it's not just about whether or not abortion is legal. That's only a tiny piece. Um, that certainly making sure that people have um, the rights and ability to, uh, deter to self determine, to make their own decisions about their reproductive futures, is not just about terminating pregnancy. It's about when and how we will get pregnant. It's about how we will give birth. It's about the families that we are raising and parenting. It's about the communities that we live in. It's really all encompassing. And so it doesn't just live within our reproductive parts. It is about sort of really understanding how all of these factors affect how we are able to move through the world and exist in the world. Um, and so I think that that is much more 
well understood across communities, across income levels. Um, I still think it's not as widespread as it could be. Um, I think that there are certainly as are portions of the population who, um, for whom so many other um, parts of their existence are upheld, that abortion just seems like the only thing that um, is under attack. Um, when for communities of color, um, just access to consistent traditional health care is also being threatened. Um, the ability to make sure that you're able to have what you need to pay for food, housing, child care, health care um, is also under attack. Um, if your sexual orientation or gender is being undermined or um, legislated out of out of existence that all we think of all of these things as, as linked because they're happening in the same body we're not thinking about these things as a single issue and so um you know i'll give a little example um that oftentimes there are organizations that endorse like a pro-choice candidate but for me if that pro-choice candidate is not also working on racial justice then they're not my candidate. Just because they are willing to stand firmly um, and, and sort of speak out for abortion access, but if they are not willing to think about my whole, li my whole life, my whole existence as just as important, then that's insufficient. And so I think that that is the nuance that, I, that is really important um, that we're gonna continue to have to push for is thinking about intersectional systems of oppression and how all of those things need to be dealt with simultaneously, that we can't single out abortion and say, oh, well, if Roe is in place, then everything is fine. Nothing is fine. Um, people are suffering even when abortion is legal. Um, so what else do we need to do to make sure that people are able to live full and thriving lives? I think that abortion experiences that people have are very different across the country because in part at the state level, policymakers have been allowed to um, create the obstacles and the barriers that folks have to navigate in order to get care. So uh, someone seeking abortion in New York City is gonna have a very different experience than someone who is seeking abortion in Cleveland, Ohio. And even still a much different abortion experience than someone in Jackson, Mississippi. The political environment, the um, threats and shame that might exist, uh, that a person might have to work through, the amount of time that, they, that it might take um, for them to be seen or to even get an appointment. Um, when in a pregnancy they are able to receive care, how much it costs, how many trips you have to make, um, what kind of protest or activity you're going to meet when you get there. All of those things can vary state to state and sometimes clinic to clinic within one state, whether it's a for-profit clinic, whether it's a nonprofit clinic, whether it's an independent clinic, whether it's a Planned Parenthood, all of those things can make a difference in the patient experience. What I believe to be true is that most abortion providers really want the people who are coming to get care to feel like they are seen, um, like they are safe, like they are cared for. And so I think what I would like people to know is that through all of the barriers that have been put in place, abortion providers are working really hard to make sure people can have the best experience possible. The reality of abortion in the United States right now is that people already have to travel for care. So even before many of the abortion bans that we're dealing with right now came into play, people have had to travel because of um, the availability of physicians, because of the weight limits, because of the parental notification, because of so many other things. Things, you know, really speaking to what 
I was talking about earlier, just the abortion experience is just so different from state to state that we've already been dealing with um, people having to figure out where they can get the best care possible, even if it's not where they live. And I think that one of the things that's so important for folks to know is that abortion funds are really the key to helping people get where they need to go. They both support people financially to make sure that they have the funds necessary to get the abortions that they want, but many of them also provide practical support, meaning money for rides, childcare, food, gas, um, sometimes plane tickets, bus tickets, train tickets, um, hotel stays, all of the things that are necessary um, that, again, folks who are not, have not had an abortion or not supported someone getting an abortion might not think to include in their healthcare costs. As we sort of think about what might be coming with the impending Supreme Court decision, um, I can't predict exactly what the Supreme Court will do, though we, um, many people don't feel very optimistic. And there is a potential for abortion access to be decimated in as many as 26 states across the country. Um, as I mentioned, abortion access is already at a precarious place, even before um, it becomes completely banned in, in many more places. So we know that uh, clinics in states that are friendly and supportive of abortion are going to um, have to figure out how to absorb caring for so many more people, for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. For us, we're trying to figure out if abortion is completely banned or partially banned in Georgia, how we can pivot, how we can uh, adapt our clinical services so that we can survive. We are not just an abortion provider. We currently provide wellness services, including gynecological care, trans health care, contraceptive care, STI testing and treatment. Um, and so considering what are the services that we can grow, um, expand or add, so that we can continue to function and operate, so we can continue to provide reproductive health care to as many people as possible um, until the time when abortion becomes available again. Because that, to me, is the certainty that even if um, the Supreme Court makes the decision to undermine the Roe versus Wade decision specifically, that does not mean the end of abortion in this country. It means that it will be severely uh, impeded for a period of time until we have the power to put it in place more permanently. Um, so my job right now has been a lot of contingency planning, a lot of trying to map out scenarios um, because we know that we need to survive this moment and we need to be here for our communities in the interim. My background really doesn't neatly align with me ending up in this work. I uh, moved to Atlanta for college. I attended Spelman College um, and studied economics. I went into banking right out of school and worked um, in community development for eight years before I left to do more community-centered work. Um, but I do think that my time at Spelman did contribute to the analysis that I bring to my work. Um, though I didn't study women's studies or feminist thought, um, it certainly was a place where my introduction to black feminism um, and the scholarship of, of black feminists um, certainly just like stirred something in me and sort of affected my understanding of my place in the world. So reading Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks and Beverly Guy Sheftal and Patricia Hill Collins and Dorothy Roberts, um, 
all of that um, was sort of like a foundational um, time for me and it stayed present. And so I think the other factor that's not um, not direct, but maybe sort of an indirect um, effect on me coming into this work is that um, my mother uh, worked at a Planned Parenthood. I was already away. I was already an adult um, when she was working at Planned Parenthood in St. Louis, where I grew up. Um, but certainly conversations with her, even introductions from her to partners that I work with today um, are a part of continuing to round out my understanding of reproductive health rights and justice. Um, and she works at Feminist Women's Health Center with me today. And I think sort of the third leg of that stool that I would count towards bringing me to where I am today is that there are people who I love in my life who had abortions. I wasn't necessarily the person who went with them to hold their hand or to drive them home, but being connected to and understanding the experience of folks who had abortions for lots of different reasons at different phases of their lives um, and being able to care for and support them, I think that also contributed to bringing me to who I am and how I am today. I don't think any of this work should be led without the voices and the experiences of people who have abortions. Um, and so abortion storytelling, being um, able to be a safe place for someone to share their abortion story um, is so important. Um, even if that abortion story doesn't change laws or end up in the New York Times, it doesn't mean that it's not super valuable and transformative to tell your story, to be able to say what you experienced out loud to someone who will be there for you lovingly. So yeah, I think those are the sort of main catalysts I think that brought me to this work. Um, in between banking and feminist center, I worked in an arts nonprofit for several years. Um, and so I have found that in my role as executive director, that's my finance background, my like arts um, and culture background all have found a place. Um, there have been ways for me to use all of those things in my job. Um, so even though it wasn't a straight line, I do feel like all things were working together to equip me to be able to do this work today.